Beers with Chad. Hey everybody, what's up? Chad Wesley Smith here. Beers with Chad episode, doing a little something special today with my man Corey Beasley, Fight Camp Conditioning. Yeah, and uh, we might drink some beverages later, probably coffee though, because it's, it's the morning here. And we're here in Corey's garage, Irvine, California. And uh, Corey works with a lot of MMA guys, jiu-jitsu, all kind of stuff. So I'm going to have him put me through the type of training that, that those guys do. Maybe a little bit scaled down version. You don't have anyone who weighs 340 doing these workouts, huh? No, not this week. All right. Well, hopefully I'll, <laughs> I'll be impressing you with my agility and everything. And we'll be talking about, you know, why we're doing the exercises that we're, that we're choosing. And we'll talk after a little bit about uh, special strength, you know, about the special demands on, uh, on fighters. And it'll be a good time. All right, man. Let's get into Sounds it. Sounds good. So it's forward crawl, backward crawl. Forward crawl, backward crawl. Knees low, heads up. Breathing as you go. So yeah, spread yourself out. Bring your knees down a little bit. <clears throat> yeah. That's it. Just thinking like you got a glass of water on your low back, keeping your hips pretty still. When you get to that garage, you just throw it in reverse. Work your way back. Yeah, breathing as you move. Relax. It's good. It's all right. I am. Better backwards than your forwards. <laughs> <clears throat> That's my assistant. Next one will go sideways. So right. just, uh, you can go knees in, just here. Or if you extend, it's a little harder. Okay. It's up to you. Sadie, come here. Go lay down. So same game, knees low, heads up. Breathing as you move. My trap's getting in the way of putting my head up very much, so. <laughs> you don't need to be up, it just need to be neutral, so you can keep it down a little. That's fine. Yeah, knees stay low, hips stay still. Easy. Good job. Take a breather. I'm good, we can... You can keep moving? Yeah, yeah. Jogging. So we'll jog forward to the end, throw it in reverse and come back. So jogging forward and backward, and then every time you come around, we'll change it up. <laughs> nice side shuffles. So just here. Nice karaoke over here. Like that high knee too? A little bit, a little bit. Yeah. Easy. And skips are last. Just skipping for height. Forward, backwards. Forward there, backwards, back. Yep. Nice. It's perfect. It's perfect. Take a breather. Feel right? Yep. Cool. So the next one we'll do that uh, when you're ready, when no rush. But the lateral leap side to side. So one foot to one foot. Jump, land under control, spring back the other way. Uh, ten total, five each way. Alright. Mm. Two. Three. Sink down into them. Oh. Six, seven, eight, nine. There it is. Cool. Good. Relax. Throws for height, scoops for height. Just uh, three to five reps. All right. And 25 is good. Yeah. So when you're looking at selecting heights, 
the weight. Or, yeah, for med ball stuff. Heavier, lighter, what are the benefits? And this one typically I go about 10% of somebody's body weight, so pretty light. Right. You know, if my guys are 125, they fight 135 pounds, something like that. It's usually a 12 pound ball, yep. 10 or 12 pound ball. Because what I'm looking for is that they can accelerate and get that ball high, not that they can lift a heavy ball real yep. and throw it barely over their head. You know, the goal is to explode. So. They, uh, we got what, six ounces, four ounces? <laughs> yeah, they got little four ounce gloves. Yeah, yeah it ain't much. It's a lot like, uh, you know, shot put, my background. Huh? Yeah, all the best shot putters, they can bench 500 and stuff. But shot put still is only 16 pounds. Like, right. it ain't really that heavy. You got to get yeah. it moving. And you'll see some of the stuff that we'll do, like I think it's pretty unique with that, that pulley that we'll use, is that we can adjust the flywheel, and then it uh -huh. measures the revolutions per minute. So it's actually seeing that velocity. So it's on that force velocity curve, I can change it from real, real heavy to extremely fast. And it's funny, it's exactly like you're saying, a lot of guys can move a lot of weight, but you ask them to move quick and they struggle. For sure. Right? right. So this one just legs and hips, shooting yeah. it for height. There it is. Four more. Good. Three. Oh, last one, big. There it is. It's perfect. So take a minute or two off. So when we're, we're doing this gonna... more explosive stuff, and the jumps you're looking, even for fighters who have to have this huge aerobic capacity, Yeah. still looking for much more quality at this point. Yeah. For sure. You know, these guys, we just get done with the warm-up. We got their body temperature up. Now I'm wanting to light up their nervous system a little bit, but like you said, those guys grind all day long. Yeah. I don't need to smash them at the same pace that they're getting in the gym. So I try to go a little bit above or below it. So if I can go a little bit heavier, a little bit more explosive, I know they're not getting that when they train. Mm -hmm. And then typically homework type stuff, or like you said, in the pool, road work, that type of stuff, that's homework. Like, hey, get your, get your aerobic development in. Yeah. And typically a lot of that stuff's done out of camp. Yeah. Or in camp, it's just used as recovery. So. How, how long do you want me to hold them? Now it's up to you, because there's different, different ability levels I'll have to do for different things. So like, if somebody's brand spanking new, uh -huh. I want them to be able to control that landing and that descent and absorb that energy. Um, if we go too hard too quick, yeah. right? That's when knees go out and all kinds of fun stuff. So right. it's up to you, as, as fast as you want to go, I want you to absorb, I want you to go back the other way. How quick that is, is completely up to the ability level and how you feel comfortable. So there are times where you have people do it much more reactively? Of course. All right. Yeah. Now those are typically guys that either have experience doing this stuff or I've worked with them long enough that they can do it proficiently and they can move quick. Yeah. Right. Maybe by the third set I'll remember how to be athletic. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, there you go. Nice. It's perfect. And five scoops for height. Exhale strong on the way up. Now, typically, the guys, I'll only see them a couple of days a week. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and like you said, they need a lot of different demands. So I don't mind pairing these things up. Yeah. You know, sure, they're going to be breathing hard, but most of those guys are in such good shape, and they only weigh 135 they pounds. Than me. <laughs> but, yeah. Big legs and hips. Good. Three. Four. Last one. That's it. <clears throat> Two rounds of that's cool. Okay. That's good. You sweating a bit, right? Well, Doesn't take much. I'm awake. I'm alive. <laughs> That's how I know I'm alive. I'm sweating. All right, cool. What we're looking for is your top position where you'd finish. Yeah. That's about it? Yeah. Um, slight stagger, back toes up. Most of the focus is going to be on that, uh, that front leg. Right. Let's do a set just so you can feel it. Now, what happens is um, however hard you pull, uh -huh. it pulls back. Okay. So you got to kind of work with it at the beginning. So, so give me a little pull and then go down, and it rounds up. 
That's it. Four, five, good. I mean, I that's it, that's it, that's good. Okay. We're just doing five reps. We'll do five per side. One, two, three, four, five. Nice, relax. Feels fine? Yeah. I just gotta get over my front leg more. A little bit. Yeah. And then uh, resistance is good? Yeah. The output, you can see the revolutions per minute on that screen. Um, which would give me, I could see the output per set or per rep, okay. which is kind of nice. So guys would be like 250, 250, 250, 190. I'm like, Fucking what happened? Fucking sandbaggers. <laughs> but it catches them, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, on this guy, we'll go big stretch, big split with your legs, and then pull, right? All right. And then back up. Then eight per hand here? Yeah, eight per. And again, I'm guessing on the weight, so. We can always adjust it. It's probably gonna be pretty light, but feel it out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Easy, nice. And again, you could probably feel it. That rope's probably a slightly bit more narrow than the average wrist you run into, <laughs> but having that Having that hand having a grab like this uh -huh. goes right in if I'm gonna grab your wrist yeah. when we're rolling. So a little bit more specific, but as the boys get used to it or, or we use thicker ropes, uh -huh. when they do go and grab somebody's wrist, it's a little bit more familiar. Six. Nice, good. That's a weight. Oh, we can go up for sure. Add a plate? Yeah. So take a breather. Typically I go like two or three minutes in between. Okay. And then we'll jump back in on that deadlift. So with the isometrics, isometrics being such a big part of grappling, we have them do like timed holds with that type of stuff too? Yeah, for sure. You know, typically we'll do uh, it depends on the individual, obviously, um, and what they're doing. Like a lot of guys, they'll train in the gi all day long, and then, then when they come to see me, they want to use those gi grips. Uh -huh. It's kind of like, all right, dude, you got enough time with the gi on, yeah. so let's change up some things. So we'll do maybe a fatter grip. We'll do a pipe grip, like a wrist grip type thing. Uh -huh. I'll maybe give them, I always try to give them something that they're not getting, yeah. but maybe developing that strength that they need. So the isometrics we'll use a lot of different ways for legs, for upper body, for you know, various positions and stuff like that that they might encounter, but I don't try to go, I don't try to mimic stuff too much. Yeah, I, you know? I worked with a lot of volleyball players particularly, and of course everyone wants to jump higher. Right. So, yeah, we got the high school kids and their parents like, well, they need to do a lot of plyometrics and all this because they need to jump higher. I was like, well, they just came from practice where they jumped like 200 times, right? Yeah. How the fuck would jumping more make them better at it? For sure. But it's like, why compound or a soccer player is doing agility drills. Why compound the same stress yeah. on top of it? They're already getting a ton of that. Uh -huh. Maybe they're doing a shitty job of it where they are, but just jumping more isn't, isn't necessarily the answer. Right. I typically, I'll try to do stuff that complements their training. Yeah. It doesn't mimic it, I guess is one way I think about it. Yeah. But maybe hitting the same types of stuff or maybe stuff that they're not thinking about. Yeah, right? Because sure. you, you, I mean, you've rolled enough where you kind of, when you're on, in practice, you're holding and squeezing and doing a lot of stuff as it is. Yeah. So maybe it's having that isometric strength on their legs or on their feet. Maybe they don't think about that when they're in practice. Yeah, yeah. the isometric stuff, uh, isometric aspect of jiu-jitsu has been the, the toughest thing for me because yeah. shot put, powerlifting, strongman, nothing isometric about any of those. It's right. you know very short burst effort, which yeah. I was very good at that. but. Burn out really quick during doing but it's a good, so. But it's a good point because your background with strength and power yeah. is unique. A lot of these kids might come in here and they've rolled since they were five years old, yeah, yeah. but they've never ever stepped foot in the gym. So how I approach that is completely different. Yeah. Right? Because you got you got a pretty damn good strength base. <laughs> you know. I guess it's enough. It's probably. <laughs> so on this one, um, now that you're a little bit more on that front foot. Yeah. 
and I'm gonna watch the readout. <clears throat> so, um, so we can see that output on each one of these. So really just same, all that energy's on that front foot. And then same mechanics is always just ribs up. Two, three, four, five, that's it, good. Two, three, four, five. Nice. Has a good adjustment on that second one. Did you feel it? Yeah. You sat back a little? Yeah. So it's good. So I mean, even from the front one or the first one, I mean, obviously you're just getting familiar with it, but I mean, that's 60 points increase. So all that's saying is that you're moving faster. That's what it's saying. You know? I saw so, the, the last rep, left leg forward and right leg forward were only one point different, right? Right, right. Yeah, so very familiar, so that's good. So I mean, you'll, you'll absolutely see, whether it's from injury or just favoring one dominant side, uh -huh. you'll see a lot of differences from right to left. I found that a ton with jujitsu stuff, drilling and probably even more because being a white belt, just playing everything as one side. Oh. All the drills one side. It's terrible. Yeah, and I can feel like my hips getting turned all this way and you know this elbow bugs me more from doing yeah. that stuff. From a strength standpoint, it's good. When you're talking about left and right, like even from taking takedowns and shooting mm. and stuff like that, a lot of guys will go, if they put this foot forward, you know what to expect. Yeah. You know, if they put this foot forward, you know what's coming. That might be a high crotch and a double. This might be a low single, you yeah, know, so. The, the coordination of it is, is one part. And yeah, being really coordinated and ambidextrous in that coordination. Takes a lot of work. Tough, yeah. For sure. Let's get another one of these split squats. The only thing I want you to change on this one is that you might go a bit longer okay. and lower. All right. All right. Yeah, it's one thing, you know, I see like a switch stance fighter or something, but if that shit was easy, everyone would do switch That's stance. That's why the guys that can do it are so dangerous. Yeah, everyone would be a switch hitter in, in baseball. Yeah, no so, doubt. And, yeah, it's crazy. The guys that can do that blow me away. Yeah. Especially when they're fluid with it. We can try to do it, but... So like right here? Right there is good. And then just pull in. One, two, three, good. Four, five, six, two more, seven, and eight. Hell yeah, nice. It's good. Yeah, real long stance. Good, and pulling. Exhale when you pull. There it is, three. Six, seven, last one. There you go. It's good, man. Feels okay? Yep. How's your hand? My right one's definitely a little bit stronger. Yeah. yeah. I notice that a lot. Uh, that one you're familiar with. Yeah. Deadlifting, right? Yeah. So uh, if people come in and they are lefty, that coordination thing, like you said, but then typically, I mean, shit, you wake up in the morning and I tell you to put your right hand in your pocket. Uh -huh. You try to brush your teeth, you're going to stab yeah. yourself in the nose, you know? Yeah. So it does. It makes a big difference. Even when we're doing all the grip stuff or stability stuff, throughout the grip all the way through the shoulder is usually just way different. Some of this, too, since I'm having a little bit of that neck issue might be going uh -huh. into my left hand, but... Yeah, but you feeling all right doing it? Oh, yeah, no problem. Um, so on this one, uh, again, we can do one, we can do two. Yeah, we can do one more round. Do one more round? Yeah. Okay, cool. All we're doing on this next one, you take a breather. We still got a minute or so. But uh, <clears throat> we'll do one more. All you're trying to do on this next one is just beat your number. All right. All right, here we go. Same, drive off that front. Careful, careful, careful. The first couple, slow-ish. Okay. All right? And then you just ramp up to it. I do like a set of six, so I'll just count the first one as like a loading. Yeah. Good. One, two, three, four, five. There it is. Better. Same game. Brace and go. One, two, three, four, five. Nice. Solid. 
see up. You know the weird thing that I'm noticing when everybody does this is that uh, every single set their numbers go up. Yeah. I don't know if their nervous system just figures it out. They're a little I, bit more comfortable doing it. I think, I mean, especially as a new exercise, I, I'd expect to get better on it every time. Yeah. Until adaptation and fatigue crossover, I guess. But right, right. You even see that if someone hasn't done like a split squat, rear foot elevated split squat in a while. They're all clumsy in second set, third set, it's better and better. Everything gets better, yeah. Yeah. But you'll feel okay with that thing yanking you back down? Yeah. It's kind of unique it's... resistance as far as, you yeah. know, in comparison to a bar or kettlebell or whatever it is. Yeah. There's a different rhythm to it uh -huh. and the, the bracing is a different feel right. than controlling it down versus it pulling you down. Yeah. So. But from everything that they said at uh, the UFC when they were testing out a lot of athletes, uh -huh. they said there was a huge eccentric deficit with a lot uh -huh. of the boys. You know, so having them, you know, somebody else trying to put their will on you. For sure. I mean, the boys are really liking doing these types of movements, and I've noticed their health <laughs> joint-wise and stuff like that. Yeah. They're, they're strong, but they're also feeling a hell of a lot better, you know, solidifying their system. Maybe their joints are a bit more solid, getting used to going back yeah. and forth. Such an interesting feeling with some of the you know, higher black belt guys that I've had the chance to roll with, like even our head professor, Philippe. He's 33, third degree black belt. You know, not competing a ton anymore, but like his... He's my size, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he's, he's probably like 5'8", 170, 175 yeah. maybe. But yeah, his strength in jujitsu specific stuff, and we'll talk more about right. special strength later, but it's phenomenal. and and things that aren't as measurable, like it's easy, oh, how much you squat, how much you bench, very, very simple numbers, but yeah. you know, how much. How strong are you when you're rolling in all these weird positions, right? Yeah. <clears throat> With odd grips and. Yeah, how much can you leg extension while you're sitting up, but <laughs> yeah. it's a person, not a weight. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, you know, and he has me floating up in the air in a butterfly guard. It's crazy, something. isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Wow. There's nothing more humbling than somebody not trying hard yeah. and <laughs> tuning you up. Same game. Real long split and pull in. Two, three, four, five, six. Good, stay with it. Two more. Last one. Nice. A lefty grip. Yeah. But I love finding stuff like that. You know? Yeah. Just little. Odds and ends, because you never know where you're going to end up. For and sure. if that gave in a tournament, yeah. <laughs> shit out of luck, right? That's good. All right, last one here. One, two, three, four, five, six, two more. Damn it. There you go. Nice chat. So as you're looking at correcting something like that, right to left grip imbalance. You know, honestly, as long as there's not an impingement or something on yeah. going on upstairs, it's literally like just a matter of using it. Tim, maybe what, usually what I'll do is I'll have them start like you did. Uh -huh. If they have a weaker side or a weaker leg, start with it. Yeah. So yeah. you're not fatigued when you're going back to the other side. I think that makes it worse. Yeah, I always have people do that. You know, lateral exercise, do your bad leg first because even though, yeah, you're just doing your left arm, your left leg, there's systemic fatigue that's happening. For sure. So. And I don't, I don't really do a whole lot of extra volume with it. Yeah. It, it comes around pretty quick if they just use it, so pretty simple. Yeah. I, I think that this is probably related to whatever's going on in the neck, but, or ready, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure that's what all the YouTube commenters were going to say already. <laughs> but you know what's funny, though, is, uh, like some ways, like even though I'm right-handed, uh -huh. my left's stronger. Yeah. So there's, it's not always what you think as far as dominant arm and all that type of stuff. So. Well, for a lot of people, there's probably a lot more structural damage to their strong side too. Yeah. And they're winged out or whatever it yeah. may be, right? Throwing a ball a million more times with my right hand than I have with my left hand. Like. Yeah, for sure. It adds up over time. For sure. All right, cool. So that's the. That's those three. So the next one, we'll do that uh, wood chop with a weight shift. Right. And we'll do this. 
And then uh, the wood chop with a weight shift, give that guy a run real quick to kind of feel it out. Again, you'll find your uh, the thing you got to do first on this. That's the end. So you get out here pretty wide. Okay. And then you finish. There's no rotation, really. It's a little bit of lateral shift. And then you're just pulling, like, maybe to your shoulder just outside. All right, so maybe, like, uh, 11 to 1 or 10 to 2 kind of rotation. Right. But mostly shift. Mostly shift. This kind of tool for, you know, shot putters, javelin throwers. On this one, I could see, like, a really big transfer for that kind of stuff. For sure. Discus, everything, because all those exercises are just pure, you know, explosive, concentric movement. It's really difficult to load it in any way eccentrically. Have you ever seen the video uh, Werner Gunther? He's a Swiss shot putter. It's, uh, it's in French. It's like a four-part video called Prep Preparation Physique. He does the gnarliest sequence of jumps that maybe a human has ever done. I want to see it. So, uh, dude's like six, seven, three, three hundred 300 pounds. He has a 12 double leg bounding sequence, like up on a box down. I'll show it to you after. But he has a, like a 22 pound, 25 pound shot put hanging from the ceiling. And he's, and it pendulum swings back to him and he catches it. And, Sick. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah, but very rare to have an eccentric loading type of exercises for that stuff. Yeah. And you play with the handles, you can play with the angle. You know, some days I'll mount that up on the side or, or up on a wall, uh -huh. and then we can adjust the angle that we're working on. More, yeah. So like for a shot putter, if they're always going yeah. low to high, it might be it's good sometimes to go yeah, for sure. the opposite way. You yeah, know? I think, you know, especially as people get further away from competition when you get a, fi a real fine-tuned technique, like that, and that's where people fuck up, you know, sports specific, special strength exercise, whatever, you know, people want to call it. And they try and just mimic the sporting movement. Yeah. But if you have something that's really fine tuned, <laughs> shot put, javelin, discus, throwing a baseball, swinging a baseball bat, golf club, like such a small change can totally disrupt their technique. Uh -huh. So, you know, the idea of throwing like overweight or underweight baseballs or overweight, underweight football, different type of of med ball throws that mimic it, like punching with bands or whatever it is, yeah. right? Those can be great farther away from competition, but when you're, you know, when you're peaking, if I was still throwing the shot put, I don't want to do this, you know, the week of the meet, right? Because it's gonna fuck my technique up, and at right. that point, that's all that matters. Exactly. So it's like. So the big thing I notice on this one, in specifically, is that guys don't shift their weight well, uh -huh. right? It's in that frontal plane a little bit. Maybe that's a little bit unique. But um, being able to shift their weight efficiently back and forth and absorb and then explode back the other way, there's a lot more going on. I think that maybe the video will show, but yeah. <laughs> it's... Uh, this thing isn't plugged in, does that matter? Uh, the only thing we won't see is the output, okay. which right now doesn't really matter to me a whole lot. I just wanted to get the rhythm of that movement first, and then um, your foot will probably be in here on the concrete. Yeah, and the rope stays tight the whole time as you go. Yeah, shift your weight and reach for that garage. That's it. That's it. Rest, rest, rest. We just do five per side. I don't know if it was like, that's it, you're getting it, or that's no, it. No, 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 no. You're, you're moving <laughs> good, but you're shifting your weight well. That inside foot, again, that left leg now will absorb and then drive across and then just reach for that. I guess you'll reach kind of for the top side of that other garage and keep that rope tight. It's a big shift. That's it, rest, rest, rest. So on that side, you'll notice on the right side, you were coming through and yeah. extending real much, well. Much more natural. On the lefty, you're almost trying to get it by rotating more. Uh -huh. So if you literally thought about reaching for that far garage and coming straight out, so like out here, Versus coming and rotating I, through. I gotta reach for it. There. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So when you shift that weight, it'll help a ton. So that's perfect. On the second one, we'll go here. So just kneeling, both knees, you can grab just clean on that handle. And then just keep everything tall. And then just pressing overhead. It's both knees. Both knees down. All right. <coughs> we good? Yeah. All right. Two, eight per three. Four, five, six, seven, 
Eight. Easy. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Easy. What is that? That was pretty easy. Okay. Yeah. Both those fill okay though? Oh, yeah. So the same as when we did that other left side, with that left side being a little wonky on that first one. Yeah. Let's go lefty first. Okay. So same game again, five on this one on each side, uh, but start facing this way. We'll work that left yeah. side first. I think that's you know, a big distinction in, in sport performance training and powerlifting training. I mean, powerlifting, I, the only specialty bar that I've really used much was the safety squat bar. Yeah. I used to do the Cambridge bar. I used to do to do Swiss grip or you know neutral grip bars yeah. and stuff like that. Injury workaround is fine, but it's like you got to do the sport. Right. And the sport is the straight bar. You got to be healthy enough on the meat. So if you need something else to work around that, that's fine. But I think people have thought that for me, because I'm always promoting for powerlifting stuff, competition exercise specificity, small variations, stance, tempo type of things. Right. That I, I don't think that those type of things are worthwhile. They're extremely worthwhile when your sport isn't played with a straight barbell. You right. Know? Yeah. Like when it's when it's just about the movement. I'm just trying uh, to get them to squat and push and pull exactly. and, you know, get some good basics in. Yeah, I think that with, with exercise selection when it comes to athletes, I don't give a shit how much they squat, front squat, box squat, safety squat bar, right. box squat, pin squat, whatever. Like, some kind of squat is great. Uh -huh. Yeah. You know? Some kind of upper body press. Yeah. Some kind of upper body pull. Some kind of hip hinge, hip extension exercise. But right. there's so many exercises that can fit into those categories, where when coaches get dogmatic about well, front squats more functional than back squat. Functional for what? Exactly. The person's function is to play football or to play basketball or to to right. fight people. You know. Well, and I think the variety. I think a lot of the variety becomes, at least from my point of view, it became handy. Uh -huh. when I do have to work around shit. Yeah, for sure. You know, and the boys come in, they're like, hey coach, uh, I tweaked my elbow. Yeah. I hurt my neck, I hurt my knee, I hurt my big toe. Well, okay, cool, we were gonna do split spots, but now what, yeah. right? And so to keep you, them you, have to be, you have to keep them engaged for sure. Yeah. But man, for anybody that works with these athletes, they're jacked up so much. Yeah. And it's just part of it, yeah. right? And you know, you'll get the rare one who like, they love to lift and, and do that part of the training. But for the most part, they love to do their sport. Right. You know, and this part is like a formality to them. Usually but. the most experienced lifters that I've come across were collegiate collegiate wrestlers, collegiate wrestlers yeah. cuz they had a good foundation of strength training with a barbell. Yeah. And they're pretty proficient. Yeah. So I can implement that stuff a little better. You know, some kid that's never stepped foot in the room, I'm like, I ain't going to take the time to teach you a clean. Yeah. You got to fight in 6 weeks. Yeah. yeah so we got to you got to time it. The uh, you, you follow that dude Trevor Snyder on uh, Instagram? Mm. -mm. The gold medalist from Ohio State. What's his name? Trevor Snyder, Snyderman. Oh, Kyle Snyder. Kyle Snyder, yeah, yeah. He's a truck. Holy shit, he's fucking strong. Hey, the boys, who was it that was telling me? Somebody was a, a light heavyweight in the UFC. And <laughs> they said, dude, I th like to think I'm a pretty good wrestler. <laughs> Drive across, reach for that garage. Much better, much better. Less rotation and you're reaching yeah. across and shifting your, shifting your weight a bit better. But uh, yeah, get that weight over to that left leg and reach for the top of that other garage. Two, three, four, five, nice. But uh, he said Kyle just ragged on him. Oh. Like, There's how a video of him pin squatting. From probably like right here. Uh -huh, I saw that. 705 or something like. He's strong. Barbell hip thrust like 600 plus. It's fucking ridiculous. Yeah, is technically, technically? Oh, yeah. Jeez, dude. I can't even fathom it. It's, it's cool because I've, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of like real high level wrestlers. Uh -huh. And they all ask. Like if they're in the, maybe wrestling internationally and stuff like that, they're trying to figure out, ah, should I fight? Do you think I should fight? And I'm like, uh. You know, it's always kind of a coin toss on yeah. what they're going to do because they could be the, the grappler that can't cover distance and just gets tuned up on their feet. But so you've worked with the, these guys, all different backgrounds. Yeah. And so if, if you had to 
outside of someone who's just always done MMA, which I guess there's going to be kids. Kids are starting. Yeah. Whether they last or not is a different story, yeah. right? But with the current population, if you had to pick one specific background for them to have as the best thing, what do you think it would be? It's hard to tell because you teach a really, really, really good striker uh -huh. how to sprawl or defend a takedown. Yeah. And I've seen them light up some good wrestlers. Um, I've also seen wrestlers that learned how to, you know, box a little bit, mm -hmm. and they're devastating, right? Because wrestlers tend to have a no, like a little bit higher strength and power, yeah. just because you know fighting with another body for all those years. Yeah, um, so they usually have a too. yeah, and they're insane. Yeah. And they have a big ass overhand right, uh -huh. right? It's like the H bomb, like Hendo and those yeah. guys, right? Everybody knows it's coming, but he still catches them. Yeah. But um, if it was me, I would say wrestling controls whether you're on your feet or on the ground. Mm -hmm. You can be really, really, really good at jujitsu, but guys like Damian Maya, you know, he's amazing. But if he can't get the guys to the ground, he yeah. gets beat up. You know? I guess that was the great debate in Connor versus Khabib. But good I think the, the ultimate has kind of got to be like a, a GSP where... He's good enough at whatever your best thing is right. to stop you from doing it, and his second best thing is better than, better than you are at it. Well, so. he was not. He didn't even wrestle. Yeah. GSP didn't wrestle. He went to the Canadian wrestling team for like two years and got buried. Yeah. Huh. And it helped. Yeah. Right. Obviously. Yeah, and then he's with Donna Hare and those guys, and oh, guys can't even imagine. Don is such a cool, his perspective, his posts yeah. and stuff like that, he's really well thought out. Yeah, I've been trying to get him on the podcast. I met him for a minute. Uh, I trained at Henzo two days when I was out there. That's cool. And trying to get him on the podcast because when I listened to him on Joe Rogan, yeah, he was talking about jiu-jitsu, but he, it was applicable to all sport training. Right. Like that, the systematic approach, understanding what the parts of the whole are, and addressing those parts to, to improve the whole. And you know, whether that's for weightlifters or for jiu-jitsu or whatever else, like it's universally applicable. Yeah. Well, I think what's interesting with him is that uh, he has a very individualized approach for you. You know, when he's approaching stuff, just like we should have in a weight room with yeah. different guys. You can't just throw everybody into the same workout and hope it works out. Um, he dials stuff in. A lot of these guys will come out of a fight, and it's like, all right, cool, what'd you learn? Or a tournament, or whatever it is, yeah. right? And they'll be like, oh, well, they never really, like, oh, I got beat, or I got caught. Oh, yeah, we'll work on that a little bit. But it's like, nah, let's, let's analyze the whole situation, yeah. why it happened, and then we'll actually work on it <laughs> after the fight yeah. and get better at it. Yeah. You know, and he, he dials in things super tight. Oh, uh, when he did that, you know, frame by frame, breakdown of Gordon Ryan versus Cyborg. I'd only been doing training jiu-jitsu for maybe three months when I listened to that. Yeah. And at first, I, I got about an hour into it, and I, I text my, my coach, Brent Littell, and I was like, Brent, like, is this guy, like, legit, or is he full of shit? Because I caught myself, you know, like, not having the prerequisite knowledge to be able to say, you know, this guy's legit or not, and feeling it in the same way that a lot of people who you know, consume strength and conditioning and powerlifting and weightlifting content online do feel or should feel rather like a, some sort of skepticism where if a guy says big words and sounds smart, it's easy to, oh yeah, this guy's a fucking genius. Right. Without, you know, because I didn't know John Donahue's credentials. Yeah. But as soon as as Brent texts me back, like, like yeah, Donahue, Death Squad, this guy, this guy, this guy, well, you got the credentials to back it up. Right. Uh, you know, we talk about expertise a lot, what makes an expert and I figure if, if they've done it, if they've coached it, if they're educated about it, if you can for sure check off two of those three, you got someone worth listening to. Yeah. Plenty of people extremely talented in whatever their field is, but they can't teach it for shit. Right. Coach, you could just be like a great recruiter, a bit tougher that way. And, you know, I'm sure we both know plenty of guys who can quote every study and talk about shit in a clinical lab sense, but have never coached. I've never coached it or never done it to any right. appreciable level. Yeah. But if you get someone who's two of the three and Donna Hare, you know, is certainly two of the three. Hey, and honestly, it's in, it can also be what I've seen a lot is they get handed a really talented, strong yeah. athlete, and all of a sudden that makes them look great. For sure. Right? Yeah, if, if Versus just, just bringing some guy up. Like, hey, can you take somebody that says a raw 
yeah. an amateur fighter and build those guys up and get them to a high level. Yeah. That's a big difference. Oh, you yeah. Know? yeah. To, to, just have one, to just have one prodigy or whatever, that could just be like the, the athlete, you know, they, Magic Johnson was a great basketball player. He was a shit basketball coach. Right. You know, because he couldn't explain how, a lot of best how to do what he did. Right, he just right. did it. And you could have that, that same thing with one great athlete, but if they're replicating it over and over. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And even taking good to great, you know, or great to the best ever, like... That's a whole other deal. Yeah, those, that last 1% come, is pretty hard to come by. Oh, man. This is rough. All right, uh, so same game again. Tall, tall kneeling again. Tall kneeling, yeah. Let's just stay with that. That's a good one. Right. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Solid. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Nice, got it. The, uh, I like that tall kneeling for a lot of guys because if I'm trying to kind of more isolate that shoulder, yeah. you know, maybe they got instability in the trunk or whatever it is, so that kind of takes their legs out of it. A lot really of guys looking... are still jumping, which maybe be yeah. great if we're power production later in the, in the program, but. You're just looking for like, Ribs and pelvis stacked there like a rib down. Yeah. Can they brace and hold and maintain that? Yeah. You know, and maybe on the knees isn't super specific for a fighter, but it sure is maybe for grapplers. Yeah. You know, they're going to be in that position a lot. And so much of that stuff's got to work ground up, right. too. If you can't do it in the regress position, yeah. right, how would you ever do it in a progress? Yeah, if I start with that, that tall kneeling, maybe then we go half kneeling. Yeah. Maybe other stuff pops out yeah. and I find new things, right? But then we'll go maybe a split stance and then we'll go, you know, we can kind of work our way up, but mm -hmm. it seems to be a pretty decent way to do yeah. it. Like from less to more built-in yeah. stability. Probably, uh, you feel them. It's probably not going to be very heavy for you. But we'll see. So it's just a push, simultaneous push and pull. I'm just trying to like tip it off its axis. Yeah, the heaviest point's gonna be right when it just comes off the ground. Uh -huh. So typically I'll go here, and we'll just push and pull and hold it. Right, there's your isometric kind of, okay. right? Similar for pushing and pulling, fighting or under hooks or whatever. Uh, same game, from, for you, bilateral on your feet pushing in, it'll be really easy. Yeah, I'll just, right? lean, just lean on it. <laughs> yeah, so split stance, harder typically. Okay. Um, depending on, you know, the push and pull, mm -hmm. one side's going to be a little awkward. But for you, maybe we go half kneeling or kneeling again. Okay. Maybe that makes it a bit tougher. So just push one, pull the other. So barely get them off the ground. So bring it down a bit. That's a little heavier. Yeah. The further you go, the lighter it gets. And we'll hold that for about 30 seconds on each side. So the purpose of this is just a lot of guys just need that isometric component, whether they're tied up against the cage or they're, you know, over under on the mat, fighting for position. Being able to hold and brace in that, a lot of guys get tired. You've heard Joe Rogan say it a million times, right? When guys are fighting up against the cage, a lot of the fans get frustrated. That's good, switch sides. A lot of the fans will get frustrated, but that is the most exhausting piece. Yeah, when you're not moving, it's like, how can you, how can you get tired from not going anywhere? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> what now I'll also notice is a lot of times that's not a really clean grip. You get a little grip. Yeah. But also push versus pull. You know, for a lot of guys, you'll see you'll find big differences from right to left. About 10 seconds and we'll go. That's it, perfect. Well, I think the, the push make a big difference too. <laughs> if you're straight arming it, then Yeah, like, posting up and getting out of yeah. the situation or whatever it is. So on this one, you go pretty wide. And then all we're doing is sweeping that rope back and forth. So your arms are kind of fluid as you're going. And you have a little bit of a, a weight shift. Just the arms are like extension of the rope, kinda? Yes, exactly. Go ahead. So, uh, so when we go, one, two, three, we'll go to 20. Right. Two, three, a little bit faster. Five, six, 
seven, eight, nine, done. That's it, that's it. So it's perfect. So all you'll do on the next one, because you're plenty strong, yeah. you'll sink down into it, okay. and you move faster. Okay. That's it. It's just a violent 20 second, or 20 reps. So this one I like a lot, because you'll see a lot of guys on the ropes. Conditioning wise, I think they're a valuable tool for the upper body, you know, but everybody tends to go up and down, yeah. which is fine, but. The strongest snap down ever. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, and we'll use it for that, but that frontal component, you know, especially when guys are squaring up and just laying into somebody, yeah, yeah. that comes in handy, right? A lot of guys will lit up. The last kid I had, Alex Perez, he fought at the Staples Center. Uh -huh. He threw like 128 punches in the first round and TKO'd the kid. Jeez. That's 120 punches. Yeah. That's a lot. We went to the, to the Staples Center one, but I'll, we didn't get in there until the main card. Oh, right on. Yeah. 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 That was the first one I'd gone to in person. It's way better to watch them on TV, but the energy is I like is the cool. I do too. Yeah. I think the f most fun fight I ever went to um, was in Vegas, and it was Aldo versus Edgar. Uh -huh. That was a good one. Yeah. But uh, so there was a Bigfoot was on there. There's a whole bunch of Brazilian guys. And it was like a soccer stadium, dude. Yeah. It was like, hey, oh, like the whole place going crazy. It was cool. But. And they went when Bigfoot, I can't remember who he fought, but he TKO'd him up against the cage. Right. And uh, dude, the place went crazy. Yeah. It was an emotional crowd, it was fun. Yeah, let's show another, another exercise with the barrel stuff just so people can get some ideas kind of flowing. So about. another one that I like <clears throat> is a tilt just here. Mm -hmm. And just a tilt okay. off to the side. If you want to make it harder, you just don't use your leg okay. and tilt. <laughs> so it's kind of like an underhook. And then trying to move them yeah, yeah. a little specific towards that. Yeah. <laughs> but really, it's almost like a unilateral like suitcase carrier or uh -huh. something like that, where it's lighting up their torso on the side. So we have a full, full kneeling. I would go full kneeling probably for you. You reach around uh, the lid of that barrel, and you're just, again, just tilting it off the ground and holding it. They all reach around. They all reach around. <laughs> Plenty of experience. So. <laughs> so we're... Right there, and you're going straight that way. Same game. Just barely get that barrel off the ground and hold it. <clears throat> That's good. Rest. I'm gonna go the other way. This one's hard for me just because my my barrel <laughs> is getting in the way of this of this barrel, so yeah. I'm kind of like a little far away from it. Uh huh. Or if I get it like if I feel Can like you get all really close get, to it, get on it. Well, actually, that's kind of harder. Maybe I'm just weak on this side. Let's go. There it is. I'm just holding it. And some of this, if we actually do these and we get guys that are under fatigue, mm -hmm. then I can make sure that they stay, you know, stay tall. Don't collapse. Don't let your head go. Keep your hips engaged. Stay tall. That's good. Rest. So little. So if you find left... I mean, you're just like exposing little different things. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that was a pretty sig significant difference in feel uh -huh. for me there. But a lot of that too is all that rotational a lot. stuff. I mean, thousands, tens of thousands of throws in the shot put and baseball, football, whatever. Yeah, it adds up for yeah. sure. <laughs> but I think, I think for, you know, like we said, with as many of these guys that are hurt yeah. or injured or beat up, the more, I can, the more I can get in there and find those little things that are a little bit off and I can solidify some of those weak links, it can't do anything but help, right? And like that, you know, that's a real special strength exercise. Like right. it is mimicking the sport movement, but the thing that everyone misses on that is it's overloading right. part of it. <laughs> like, right, so these are like uh, 450 pounds each right now. Yeah. <clears throat> I could take those big 100 pound chains and dump them in there real quick. I can put plates in there. I just screw the top off and throw them in. It's just full of sand. Yeah, what, um, like where, do, where do you get one of these? It's just a pickle barrel. Okay. Yeah. Well, I never eat pickles, so. <laughs> You don't get pickle barrels. I'm, I'm actually big. concerned to have even touched it if there's pickle <laughs> juice. You know, that, that stuff never comes. It's my, my worst. Chick-fil-A sometimes, they forget. I say no pickles. They forget to take the pickles off. It's a big the, moment. The, the pickles stain, they stain the bun with their, with their pickle stink. <laughs> but it's a, uh, 
John Brookfield showed me these okay. one yeah, time, yeah. you know, and uh, you can load them up with different, you can roll them up with gravel or something like that, but yeah. he had his all the way up to like eight or 900 pounds. Jeez. But uh, I just had to go all the way to Chula Vista uh -huh. to find a barrel company down there that had them. Pickle farm? Yeah, exactly. So lower and faster. A little bit lower, a little bit faster, 20 total. All right. Wider stance lower or squat down more lower? It's 100% up to you. All right. Well, maybe a little bit more. 20 total. That's what threw me off last time. I thought I was going to 20 each side. No, no, no. That's, That's a horrible day. Oh, sandbagging me. <laughs> All, right. All right, let's go. There it is. Done. Rest. It's perfect. So you add a little bit of speed, and it gets a little bit harder. Sure. Right? Now, if you wanted, I, I typically don't do it a whole lot, but then you can add some movement into oh, it as well. So you might move a bit as yeah. you're doing it, which, you know, guys are wailing away on punches and stuff like that. They got to pivot and get the hell out of the way. Yep. Uh, we can stagger the stance a bit, maybe more like fight stance to make it more specific. Um, but I like just letting them sit down into it and go have at it. So when they, when they just hunker down and start blasting away on it, do you time those? Or are you just looking at the speed of it? Depends. So the longest flurry in UFC history is only seven seconds. Uh -huh. You know, so a lot of times guys are like, oh, I got to be able to go for 30 seconds to a minute. It's like, yeah. nah, dude, you need to be really fucking violent for five seconds, recover and repeat that. Yeah. So that 20 seconds, if we timed it, it's probably about four or five seconds. Uh -huh. um, I like that time frame. Um, and then what I'll do is adjust the rest period depending on where they're at, whether we're looking for peak power or we're looking for capacity or whatever it is. You see that shit with like football guys, you know, old school football coaches, baseball coaches, having guys do long distance running or something. And the game's three hours, but it's three hours of five seconds with 20, 30, 40 seconds rest, couple, you know, five, 10 minutes rest here and there. Right. Pitcher, it's two seconds, one second, and then rest 20, one second, rest 20. Yeah. What the fuck are they jogging for? You know? Yeah. And I found this movement, like you were talking about, from your growing to your hips, oh. to bracing down into the ground, and then throwing side to side yeah. was the boys, it wrecks them. Yeah. I mean, as far as the tension that's going through your whole system, holding it down. Um, so that five seconds is pretty rough. Yeah. You know, have somebody do that for 30 seconds. It's like, ooh. Well, it's, it's things like that, that ability to transfer power from the ground through the body. That is such like a very difficult to measure, but the real magic to success in so many of these sports, like uh, throwing, you know, shot discus. My my roommate, my first two years in college, a guy named Nate Rolf, he was the number one thrower in the whole country, like all the events combined, coming out of high school, 60 feet in the shot, 206 in the discus, 240 in the hammer, 190 in the jab, 75 feet or something in the weight throw. But you didn't look at him and, and think like, oh man, this guy's a fucking beast and very average weight room guy. Mm -hmm. But you could give him anything Football, baseball, shot put, discus, med ball, you know, pud, like whatever, <laughs> yeah. kettlebell, he could throw the hell out of it because he understood how to drive his feet into the ground right. and take that energy back through his body and connect it well, to whatever he was letting go. I think that's where that, he's, he's, but he's efficient. For sure. Right? And I think that that's why I always ask everybody, like, hey, what's farm boy strength? Yeah. And a lot of the dudes that I've, ever rolled with that were the biggest monsters, they either wrenched, uh -huh. they did concrete work, construction, yeah, yeah. or they grew up on a farm. And it's like they maybe didn't, were like not impressive in the weight room, but damn it, you did not want to roll with those dudes because yeah. they were gorillas. But yeah. they understood just, they were not weak anywhere. Yeah. But they just did a lot of different work in a lot of different ways, standing on their feet, yeah. And when they did put their hands on you, you knew you were in trouble. And that stuff too, I think it's a, it's a testament to submaximal training. Right. It's a testament to frequency. Yeah. Because, you know, the body doesn't know ropes or versipulleys or squats or bench or, or yeah. anything, or, you know, or, or hay bales or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it knows when you give it this solid amount of stimulus. Over and over and over and six over. six hours and then... Did it again, and it wasn't maximal. It wasn't tearing them down too much. It was enough that they, they could or had to repeat it again the next day, repeat it again the next yeah. day. 
And that shit just adds up. Like, my, my mom grew up on a really small town, like 150 people in northern Minnesota on a farm. And I remember going up there when they were, they were selling it, and my grandpa was, let's say, 75, had Parkinson's, like, not in good health, but had, you know, fought in World War II and then worked the farm every day for... A tough old man. Yeah, for 40 years. And I'm watching my dad and my uncle kind of struggle to carry this outboard boat motor and my grandpa, you know, just kind of waddle over and like, get the fuck out of my way, city slickers. <laughs> and, and like, this Husafel carry this, this yeah. boat motor. I'm like, damn, like, how can you do that? And it's like, if, if you had a kid, and I think, I think this is why there are so many really high result powerlifting records still from the like six, late 60s, early 70s. Because if you grew up in the 40s, you did manual labor. You did work. You walked places or ran places, and you did manual labor mm -hmm. to a varying degree. And if you have a kid from six years old, does whatever farm work a six-year-old kid can do, five, six days a week, and it, he progressively overloads that because that's what his family needs him to do, uh -huh. you know, until he's... Or he just wants to get his work done quicker. Yeah. That's usually what it is. Yeah, I mean, but he can, right? he can help more. He can do sure. more work. And he does that till he's 18 and then starts lifting weights. And you have someone who starts lifting weights when they're 18, but they did whatever the fuck. Played iPad. Yeah, those first 12 <laughs> years. How would you ever catch up the volume of, of work and you work won't. capacity that that person accumulated in 12 years? It's impossible. That's why a lot of those kids yeah. that I knew would go to wrestling practice. Mm -hmm. They would beat the brakes off most people in there. And then they would laugh and they were still energetic and they wanted to go cause trouble or do something yeah. else. Like it was, that was like a vacation for them. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's maybe drink, drink these coffees and, and yeah. talk a little bit and I'll help you clean this stuff up. Cool. All right, so we just uh, wrapped up the workout enjoying some fine Thunder King cold brew. Uh, Corey, thanks a lot, man, for Yeah, for I appreciate out you today. coming. Yeah. Hope you had fun. Yeah. Uh, ready for the UFC or what? Yeah, you're like yeah. one or two weeks out. Yeah. <laughs> one or two weeks out from the UFC. I don't UFC. know if you're going to make 265, but, you know. It's a bit. I, I we'll cut bit, some weight. It'll be fine. To go. We're going to need to chop a leg, chop a leg off. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we were talking about the, the special strength stuff and that farm boy strength. Um, yeah, I just bought a new house and I put in this, this fire pit, like a custom-built fire pit, and... And the guys had uh, hired guys to do like the masonry work and stuff. But when it was time to fill it up with all the sand and gravel and, and everything, I was like, ah, I don't need to pay someone to do that. I'll do it myself. So I, I was, you know, I'm a city slicker, soft, you know, Orange County kid, like grew up in Irvine and never, never really did a lot of manual labor. Yeah. So I, it ended up taking uh, 2,400 pounds of sand and, and pea gravel to fill this thing up. So I'm loading these bags in the back of my truck and then carrying them from the truck to the backyard and pouring it all out. And it was, you know, two, hour, two hours of work or something. Right. But at the end of it, my fucking hands are tired and my arms are tired, uh -huh. that kind of like twisting to take them out. And I got to thinking, I was like, shit, I would be strong if I did this every oh day. My gosh. Or someone who does this every day, like I don't want to fucking roll with them because that's that kind of... That's the strength that you need. Yeah, immeasurable yeah. grappling strength. So as, as, you know, a lot of the things that, that I did today uh, classify as like a special strength exercise. Right. What do you think, you know, how do you delineate between like that kind of stuff that, that works and is worthwhile and, you know, people who are just like jerking off thinking they're doing yeah, something they're creative. Yeah, trying to do something weird. But uh, I, I, for me, it really just comes down to trying it. Like, I don't know, the same principles exist when I use, you know, something that's a little bit more specific or mm. maybe odd or whatever it is, I'm still thinking of the same movement patterns, squatting and hinging and pushing and pulling and that type of stuff. I'm still trying to manipulate the intensity and volume and stuff over time. But um, when you try something, or at least when I try something, some stuff feels really good yeah. and it just works. And other times you try stuff and you're like, ah, it just doesn't feel right. And if, like, you've heard people say, if it doesn't look athletic, it's probably not. So I kind of use that to kind of differentiate. But um, when you try certain things, like the landmine press, for example, that we did, like that's a pretty damn good press for a lot of guys, right? Maybe they mm -hmm. can't get their hands overhead, so it's not safe for them to do it, but I can get them pushing at a different angle. Um, so I just typically, if you try stuff, and if it works, it works, and if it doesn't. Plus, it's a matter of how hard is it to teach. Yeah. Like maybe I'm a little bit more coordinated than the average bear and I can do stuff, but then I have my boys do it and I'm like, all right, that's not working. 
You know, so I, then we had to change it. I was really surprised by that working with the jujitsu guys. I had a lot of these black belts straight from Brazil and trying to get them to do anything in the gym. A lot of them had no right. background in it. And even sprinting, jumping type of things. I'm like, didn't no. you fuckers play soccer <laughs> down there or something? Like yeah, no. sprinting looking like you're having a damn seizure the whole time. Yeah. But, but you get them on the mat or oh, you yeah. get them in a cage and they flow and they move incredibly well. Yeah. So it's just a, it's a new thing for us. Yeah. You're used to field sports maybe or different things like that where guys have spent a lot of time doing that. Yeah. But you put those same guys that are athletic on the field on the mat. For sure. And they look like a two-year-old. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just a, it's a whole different, whole different world. Yeah. The, uh, so as you, as you look at these populations, you know, MMA, Jiu-Jitsu, Muay Thai that you work with a lot, if, if you can pull out a couple big mistakes you see being made, what, would, what do you think those would be? Uh, I think the, the biggest thing is, is just controlling or having a plan for the week or the quarter or whatever. They don't have seasons. Mm -hmm. And the hard part is, is if, if you just fought, right? Well, I have a fight two months from now. You still have to help me, right? That's kind of the, yeah, the rule yeah. in a gym, right? So those guys are never really having downtime. Maybe they take a week off after if they're lucky. But just the plan for the week, they don't typically have a real sketched out plan. They just want to do a lot, especially yeah. the MMA guys. But jujitsu, same. I've talked to jujitsu competitors that were incredibly good. And I'm like, okay, cool. Let's look at your schedule. And I'd say, all right, well, you're training six hours a day on the mat? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, can we cut a session or two out? Yeah. No. Right? So then it's like, oh, well, damn, dude. Oh, yeah. Now we have to adjust. MMA guys, too, they got hands and stand-up, and then they got grappling, and then they have jujitsu, and they have all these other aspects. Yeah, so a four, lot of them. Four or five different cooks in the kitchen. Yeah, yeah I mean. Four and or five different coaches. Hopefully, and that's pretty rare to be under one roof, but most of the time they're going to this place and then they're going to that place and yeah. that place and then nobody's communicating and, and the kid and just like thinking he just wants to be tough and just get through it. Yeah, and, and every coach in, the, in that situation when it's four or five different places, guys got egos and it's, you know, these are sports that lend themselves to, to egos, I think. Yeah. And, and they all want to be the, the guy who's who's making it happen for him. For sure. Yeah, they want him to be known for his wrestling, so the wrestling training is the most important, and this guy wants him to be known for yeah. his striking, so the Muay Thai stuff's most important. And, and understanding that stress, I mean, those sports, by their nature, people get hurt. Yeah. Right? You get an elbow locked out, you get shoulders hurt, you break your hand, whatever it is, and um, you add that with and crazy volume and intensity and all that type of stuff, it's just a recipe for disaster. So it's that, that need for program management that exists and, and fatigue management within that. Right. So are, what are you doing to, to help monitor fatigue for these guys? you use HRV or anything like that? Or? I've used the MegaWave quite a bit. Uh -huh. um, and as long as they use it, I mean, I always forget too, we're dealing with 20 to 30 year old males, Yeah. right? And not, at least for me, when I was 20 to 30, I wasn't the most focused cat in the place, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, um, but if you can just get them a little bit more educated on some basics, food, sleep, you know, and then maybe taking like a Wednesday afternoon and a Sunday off or something like that, they are 20. They are like superheroes. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? They do pretty well. If you can just get those basics down. If we add the HRV thing in there and they're using it, that helps me at least maybe control the workouts that we're doing that day. Yeah. You know? And and probably be able to to go to that athlete with something objective and say like, hey, you're you're not that well recovered. So let's Yeah. Yeah, you know, let's let's look at what your diet's like. How many hours did you sleep last night? And, and And also what it does too, if they'll do it after the fact, is I could say, look, when you spar, what happened? And they see red. Yeah. Okay, cool, I'm fried. The next morning they still see red. All right, cool. We're not wrestling live today. Let's yeah. take a day off. Maybe you drill. Maybe you just adjust a little. And there's like, I've seen it over the last four or five years change dramatically, right? Like you said, we are working through the mud a mm -hmm. bit to change some mindsets, but things are changing a lot. And I think, uh, especially now, as you know, guys like uh, Uriah Faber, um, you know, has retired, right? He's mm -hmm. a pretty high level fighter. Um, He's got my my our friends at. Renaissance periodization, doing diets for alpha male. Oh, really? You know? Yeah. Nice. But um, I was with him in June at the UFC Performance Institute, and you see maybe a lot of the older coaches not quite so engaged yeah. when they're learning about work and rest and all these different things. 
But young guys like him, mm -hmm. hell yeah. I want to learn more about it. They're asking good questions. They're yep. trying to figure out what's going to be best practice for the boys so that the, maybe their boys do a bit better. Yeah. And I think that'll be a natural evolution that's probably happened in every sport. For sure. Yeah. Uh, tell us about, about your business, about Fight Camp Conditioning. Um, yeah, so I started, when we opened our second gym here uh -huh. in Orange County, uh, the first gym was lined with shirts and shorts and gloves and banners and all that stuff from all the boys coming through, and I always thought it was real cool, and most people liked it. The average Joe that came in the gym was scared to death to come to yeah. our gym because <laughs> I was like, oh my God, all these spiders are there. You know, without, not, they, you know, just perception, yeah. right? So I said, all right, if we're going to open a 7,000 square foot facility and spend all this money, like we need to rebrand it. So we had completely rebranded it and went a different direction, but I didn't want to lose, I mean, that's kind of where my heart was. Yeah. So I wanted to keep that around. So I was thinking about it. I started fightcampconditioning.com to still have a platform for them. But I also thought, I don't want it to all be me. One, because I'm not the smartest guy in the community. There's a lot of people doing good stuff. Two, I don't want to create all the content, you know? Uh, and three, for all kinds of wrestlers and grapplers, there's a need for that, Yeah. that good information. So uh, that's kind of where it started. And I just showcase coaches and athletes and the programs that they're doing so that, you know, hopefully people start to hear common themes from different coaches, mm -hmm. whether it's on the podcast or through video. Um, they can get access to good programming if they want it. And um, hopefully it just kind of fine tunes their, their training and helps them be a little bit, maybe they last longer, maybe they can become more athletic. And stuff. Where can uh, people follow along, find all the, the different things you guys are doing with that? Uh, if you look Fight Camp Conditioning across all the platforms, you'll yeah. find it. You know, fightcampconditioning.com is the website. Yeah, and you guys do a podcast as well? Yep, we do podcasts, we got videos, articles, you know, all kinds of stuff. Awesome. Well, Corey, thank you so much for, uh, for having me. Yeah, putting man. Me, Cheers. Putting me through the paces here. Glad you made it. Uh, so I'm Chad Smith. This is Beers with Chad, Coffee with Chad this morning with Corey Beasley, Fight Camp Conditioning. Uh, it was good, good time training out here. If you like the podcast, go on iTunes, give it a five-star review. Uh, write me something funny or nice. I got a... My, my jug life exits are, are taking over the beers of Chad ones, but uh, <laughs> subscribe to the channel, share the video with, with friends, going to try and do more content like this where I, I get out and do you know, different kinds of training with different, different coaches and athletes and, and see what I can learn from them and have, have some fun doing it. So uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you next time. Thanks, Corey. Thanks, man.